Good evening, everyone, who are watching the program from India, and good morning to those who are watching it from the United States. Welcome, all of you, to the 86th live program on orthopedic principles. And this time, we are back with our stellar faculty, Dr. Savia Sachi Tucker from the Mecca of Medicine, John Hopkins Institute, Baltimore, United States. Savia has been with us before, and his main interests are in primary and revision and complex arthroplasty. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Savia once again for this fantastic live program on orthopedic principles. Over to you, Savia. Thank you very much, Hitesh. Uh, again, good evening to everybody in India and good morning to everybody in the United States and wishing everyone a happy Father's Day in advance. So, so keep plugging away. Uh, and I hope you're gonna get pampered by your significant others today. Um, so today I thought that we could change gears from my last topic and speak on knees. The last time we spoke about hips, today we're gonna explore this concept of kinematic alignment but we're not just gonna restrict ourselves to that. We are going to also look at kinematic implants or so-called kinematic implants. And what should we pick? Should we pick a kinematically aligned knee with a standard implant, or should we pick a kinematically designed implant and place it with mechanical alignment principles? And what's the best way to restore anatomic function of the knee? Once again, as Hitesh mentioned, I work at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And my disclosures relevant to this talk is that I'm a consultant designer for OrthAlign, which is a portable handheld navigation system. It's a small console navigation system that allows you to place knees and unis either in a kinematically aligned fashion or mechanically aligned fashion. So the objectives of this talk Number one are to review how we can align knees. Should we perform mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment, or all these other variants in between? And then the other objective is to look at the various different kinematic implant options. And there are several implant options, the design philosophies of which I will review, and then look at their outcomes. So, First off, let's think about alignment options. And this is a wonderful review paper published by a close friend of mine who's the first author, Charles Rivier. Charles is a French trained surgeon who now works in London. And he presented this very nice schematic which shows you the various different alignment options. So a lot of people in Europe have this alignment of constitutional varus. In fact, even a lot of people in India are starting to have that as a part of their osteoarthritic deformity. Constitutional virus is when you know, someone belongs in this range of about five or, or more degrees of virus. And sometimes a lot of soccer players or athletes belong in this group and they're very athletic um, because of this constitution. So uh, Professor Bellemans in Belgium kind of came up with this concept that, hey, if we are going to take these patients who are in constitutional virus and make them neutrally aligned, which means take out their virus. Are they going to be happy or are they going to be upset because of this change in their constitution? So let's take this example of a patient in constitutional virus. The picture on the left shows you uh, how that patient would look and then the schematics show you where the limb belongs. Now on the extreme right-hand side, you see a mechanically aligned knee replacement which is perpendicular to the mechanical axis, which is drawn from the center of the femoral head all the way down to the center of the ankle. You also have this concept of adjusted anatomic, which is the old anatomic concept in which, I'm sorry, I progressed, but an adjusted anatomic concept in which patients have a little bit of valgus at their joint line. Then you go on to the hybrid alignment techniques in which you have adjusted mechanical, in which you're making some adjustments in the mechanical axis and keeping the joint line in a little bit of varus, or you're using restricted kinematic principles, again, keeping them in a little bit of varus. And then you go to purely patient-specific alignment techniques, such as perform a unicondylar knee arthroplasty in which you preserve the ligaments and you don't really want to perform any ligament releases because there isn't 
significant ligamentous uh, defects or ligamentous uh, contractures that you have to release when performing a uni or a true kinematic aligned knee, which is a patient specific bony procedure sparing the soft tissues. So let's kind of see these definitions once again. In a mechanically aligned knee, you are perpendicular to the mechanical axis. In an anatomically aligned uh, knee, you have some valgus in the joint line. In adjusted mechanical alignment, you are under correcting the frontal or coronal plane deformity to within three degrees uh, of neutral with femoral modification. In a kinematically aligned procedure, you're really focusing on the bones. You're not focusing on the soft tissues as much. And then this is this hybrid technique of restricted kinematic where you're restricting your indications of performing a kinematic alignment to within three degrees of deformity in the coronal plane and in the sagittal plane and within five degrees of joint line obliquity. So now that we have the definitions intact, you know, what are the main features separating a kinematically aligned technique from a mechanically aligned technique? So mechanical alignment is the insol principle that we've been following it from years, where basically we want to correct the mechanical axis of the joint to within three degrees. Uh, and that range has been expanded by some of the studies out of the Mayo Clinic, saying that you don't have to aim for zero degrees or neutral, you can be within three degrees and it could be forgiving. A kinematic principle, these are the differences. So what is the femoral component horizontal rotation? You know, in a mechanically aligned knee, you are traditionally externally rotating the femoral component relative to the PCL or relative to the posterior condylar axis to preserve the kinematics of the patellofemoral joint. When it comes to kinematically aligned knee, you're keeping that rotation neutral. So it's a little counterintuitive. You're keeping that rotation neutral. What about the anterior posterior position of the femoral component? Well, in the kinematic knee, since you're focusing only on bony landmarks, you're only using the posterior referencing technique. So you're relying on those posterior condyles. But in the mechanically aligned technique, you can rely either on the anterior surface of the femur or on the posterior condyles. And, you know, we switch this. If this is a valgus knee in which you have a hypoplastic lateral posterior condyle, then you sometimes go into anterior referencing to make sure that you don't account for that defect uh, in that posterior lateral condyle. What about the tibial positioning? So in a kinematic principle, you don't pay any attention to the ankle. You don't care where the joint line of the tibia proximally is in relation to the ankle. But in a mechanically aligned knee, you care about where the ankle is and you want to make sure that the joint line at the ankle and the joint line of the tibia are as parallel as possible, which makes the uh, axis between the tibial component and the mechanical axis of the tibia usually within 90 degrees, plus or minus three degrees. The sagittal rotation of the tibia in the kinematically aligned knee is parallel to the medial plateau slope. So you're really focusing on that medial plateau. The horizontal rotation of the tibial component in a kinematically aligned knee is parallel to the lateral plateau axis. So you're focusing on the native anatomy of the tibia when you're placing your tibial component. And there is no soft tissue balancing in between the femur and the, and the tibia in a kinematically aligned knee. Whereas in a mechanical knee, a mechanically aligned knee as Insol professed, this is a bony and a soft tissue procedure. So you have to make precise bone cuts, but you also have to perform precise soft tissue releases. Now, why are people going away from soft tissue releases? The biggest problem is that almost, and you can look at literature around the world, 80 to 85% of patients who undergo total knee replacements are happy with this procedure. But there is this holy grail, 10 to 15% of patients are unhappy. And why are they unhappy is a concern. The kinematic believers think that this is mainly because of soft tissue releasing. And if we release their soft tissue, we take patients away from their constitutional alignment and they become unhappy. Whereas the mechanical believers are that the soft tissues play an important role and we have to balance them in addition to balancing the, uh, in addition to the bone cuts. And again, in the patero-femoral compartment, there is no balancing in the kinematic technique. And often we have to balance that in the mechanically aligned technique. So that's kind of the basic definition 
or comparison between kinematic and mechanical alignment. What about the so-called kinematically designed implant options? Well, there are several in the market today. And let's, let's kind of look at the design features and then assess them critically. So the first one is the rotating platform. Uh, predominantly, Depew makes this prosthesis. It's been around for several years now and with some design variations. So it's a rotational articulation between the, uh, between the polyethylene and the tibial base plate. What it aims to do is that it aims to uncouple the translation that happens on the knee and the rotation that happens in the knee. And there are two basic types. One is the central uh, pivot, where you have a central peg and the polyethylene rotates around that central peg. And the second type are meniscal bearings. And often we've seen this in a Biomet Zimmer Oxford uh, type of uh, unicordial knee arthroplasty, where the bearing is a mobile bearing. It's almost like a medial meniscus and it translates, rotates, and it uncouples those forces. What about the medial pivot design? The medial pivot design is an interesting design concept in which uh, the focus is on, on keeping the medial site of the knee tight. And it's a ball and socket articulation, almost like a hip joint. And the lateral side is kept loose. Naturally, our knees, if you examine our knees from a sports perspective or from an arthritis perspective, medially the knees are a little bit tight. Laterally, they have some laxity or play associated with them. So this implant design um, is focused on that. So medially, you have a conforming ball and socket because of which you have minimal uh, femoral rollback medially. And there is an increased curvature of the medial femoral condyle and increased congruence of the polyethylene medially to really create that nice ball and socket construct. And laterally, it's rather flat to allow, allow for that translational effect. Moving on from medial pivot designs is an asymmetric design. And this is an example of a Smith & Nephew Journey system, the Journey 2 system, in which there is asymmetry built um, in the femoral or the tibial components. Even the Zimmer persona has a variant of this. Um, so you have uh, an asymmetric distal femoral cut. You also have an asymmetric uh, polyethylene. It is more concave medially and it is more convex laterally. Uh, and there is, a, there is an asymmetric slope built into it is this. And what happens when you look at x-rays, it's a little bit disconcerting when you put these implants in for the first time. When you look at the x-ray, you notice that there is uh, a joint line obliquity of about three degrees of uh, varus that is built into this construct. And the reason for doing that is because it is restoring patients to the three degrees of virus principle. And thinking about this asymmetric implant is what got me started. Because if I take this implant, which is already in three degrees of virus, and now I apply kinematic principles and put the joint line in maybe five or six degrees of virus. So the, new, the, the resultant virus may be five or six degrees plus the three degrees. So you now you're putting this in you know, a good seven to 10 degrees of virus. And is that favorable for the implant longevity? Um, or should we put this in a mechanically aligned principle? The other thought is, what if you have a patient in constitutional valgus and now you shift them from a valgus aligned knee to a constitutional virus using this implant? So are we still preserving the natural anatomy of the knee? And finally, is this implant, which is called the bicruciate retaining implant. And, you know, there are only two companies, Biomet Zimmer had this, but now they've, I think, pulled it out of the uh, market. It was the Vanguard uh, type implant. Um, and the Smith & Nephew folks have this as well, in which you retain the ACL and the PCL. And the idea behind it is that the ACL seems to provide some proprioceptive advantage. Preserving the ACL preserves the proprioception of the knee is the thought. And if you preserve that in an arthritic knee, maybe you can give them a more natural appearing or a natural feeling knee. Uh, but this idea isn't new. Uh, in the 60s, there was the Gunston polycentric knee. In the 70s, Coventry came out with the design. And in the 90s, Townley came out with the design. So this design has seen various different iterations and various failures. And it's very technically challenging to apply this uh, design because you're essentially performing two unis through a medial parapetellar or a subvastus uh, approach uh, or a midvastus approach. And that can be difficult to preserve the ACL and the PCL. And now this has taken an extension because patient specific options are also available. So what I thought was that 
how do you assess whether kinematics in terms of alignment or implants perform? So how do we assess performance metrics? Number one, are or is the natural kinematics of the knee restored? So are you giving patients a natural knee? That's the question. Number two, if you're giving them a natural knee or a natural feeling knee, uh, can patients function better? So can they walk better? Can they climb stairs better? Can they perform activities of daily living better? And the most important thing is, can they forget that they have a total knee replacement? So what is their forgotten joint score? And I'll show you some data on this. And finally, um, depending on what type of alignment you use or what type of implant you use, what's the effect on the implant and what's the effect on the underlying bone? So what's the implant and the bone longevity? And this is what we need to critically assess. So before we delve into the literature, let's first uh, you know, have, a, uh, have a primer on what, is, what are the native knee kinematics? So how does a native knee be be behave in a non-arthritic knee? And I'll show you some of the complexities. So you know, the hip is very simple. It's a ball and socket, and you really have to adjust the abductor tension to get it right. But a knee is more complex. There are three translational axes in the anterior posterior plane, in the medial lateral plane, and in compression, uh, compression and distraction. And then there are three rotational axes in the knee, flexion extension, internal rotation, external rotation, varus and valgus. So let's look at different motions. In deep flexion, what tends to happen is that there is more posterior translation of the lateral femoral condyle compared to the medial femoral condyle. And that is equivalent to tibial internal rotation, especially between zero to 120 degrees of flexion. What about in gait? In gait, what has been studied the most out of all the literature is the stance phase of gait. So when you're standing, in that there is anterior translation of the lateral femur and the medial femur during flexion and posterior translation during extension. So there is this paradoxical motion and that happens mainly because of the ground reactive forces on your leg, that's Newton's third law. To every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if your knee is pushing on the ground, there is an equal force and that causes a paradoxical motion in the knee to compensate for that ground reactive force. What about using stairs? Um, in using stairs, people have studied going upstairs more than coming downstairs. And in that, again, there is anterior translation during extension and there is equivalent translation between the lateral femur and the medial femur, so that it's, it's the same amount. What about sitting down and standing up? So from a chair, from a car, uh, that happens to be similar to deep knee flexion and extension. Running, in running, most of the people have studied low speed running on a treadmill. It's hard to study running with an athlete, uh, with a marathon runner, or uh, you know, studying someone like Usain Bolt and seeing how his knee kinematics fare. In running, there is a paradoxical motion again. The lateral femur tends to translate anteriorly during flexion, but that's less of a translation than the medial femur. So a little bit interesting because I just described the medial pivot design in which the medial side is tight, but now I'm saying that the medial side tends to be a little more loose in extension anteriorly. And running is really speed and slope dependent. So depending on where you're running, it matters. So as you can imagine, I've gone over a lot of kinematic principles and I'm not really an engineer, but now if you had to extrapolate all this data and come up with a total knee design and account for these kinematic variations with different motions, you can begin to appreciate the complexity of designing a total knee. It's not a simple ball and socket articulation. So let's look at the first principle, are kinematics restored? So this is a study that came out of Japan, which looked at kinematics and contact forces, and they looked at computer simulation, and they had three paradigms. The first one is a mechanically aligned total knee. The second one is a three degree kinematically aligned. So that's the restricted kinematically aligned knee. And the last one is a five degree. So it's an outlier. They said that, oh, something went wrong and we have an outlier. So, you know, the purist would say this is a truly kinematically aligned knee. Uh, in all these cases, what happens is that the femur was placed in valgus and internal rotation by kinematic alignment principles, and the tibia was placed in varus and also internal rotation. So counterintuitive than the mechanically aligned knee. 
and they used a cruciate retaining implant to study what happens. And what they found was that the first row shows the mechanically aligned knee, then is the three degree kinematic, and then is the five degree. And as you can see, this is medial in red, and this is lateral in blue, that in flexion, there seems to be femoral external rotation for kinematically aligned knees, especially for the five degree outlier group. And there is a reverse rotation pattern for mechanically aligned knees. So in flexion, usually we say that there is more lateral femoral rotation or translation compared to the medial side. And you see that in a kinematic knee. So that's a good thing. But there is also more patella maltracking and lateral tilt with a kinematically aligned knee. So as you can see, as the various degrees of flexion occur, the patella seems to be tracking very well in a mechanically aligned model because that femur is externally rotated compared to the posterior to the PCL. Whereas in a kinematic model, it's a neutral to an internal rotation. So now all of a sudden there is patella maltracking beginning to happen and there seems to be more lateral tilt of the patella. With more maltracking and lateral tilt, there seems to be greater forces on that patellar component, especially in early degrees of flexion. So patients with a kinematically aligned knee may begin to have more anterior knee pain and more patellar maltracking or patellar dislocation. So this is a problem. Even though you may give them more uh, improved femorotibial kinematics, but when you look at the patellofemoral joint, it doesn't seem to be ideal. And these were similar stresses uh, noted in deep flexion. Also, what they noticed was the implant force. So the contact stress was greater medially with a greater varus tilt of the tibia. And as you can imagine, now you're loading that medial side of the polyethylene more, and that may be subject to failure early on. So there is more normal knee kinematics, but increased implant forces. How do you rationalize this? Now, let's say a patient, you know, most patients, I would say about 80 to 90% of patients that have knee arthritis go into a varus deformity uh, that you correct. And maybe about 10 or 15% of patients go into a valgus deformity. So in this case, if the natural anatomy of the knee predisposes them to a varus deformity with more medial wear, which then you aim to correct, and let's say you put an implant in kinematically aligned knees and you stress that varus compartment or the medial compartment more, eventually, you're going to have failure of that medial compartment once again. So you are recreating the anatomy that failed in the first place. So it involves a little bit of thought. Should we be doing this or should we just say, no, take that away and correct them back to where they should be. Now, what about the mechanically aligned knee? Does that have better patellofemoral kinematics? I just showed you that that seems to be the case, but you know, Charles Rivier looked at this with his group and what they did is that patients with a mechanical aligned knee, uh, whether or not they have patella resurfacing, still have anterior knee pain. And patella motion tends to be a lot more complex than just aligning the, the femur and aligning the patella component. It depends on the geometry of the trochlea, and we've seen different implant systems. So if you use a Depew Sigma, frequently patients end up with a clunk that box is very sharp. Uh, and you use uh, uh, some of the newer generation implants like in a Tune or a Zimmer Persona, that seems to be more forgiving. And also it depends on soft tissue restraints. But what Charles discovered is that you have to also think about the distal femoral joint line obliquity. So that's D-F-G-L-J-L-O, distal femoral joint line obliquity. And they achieved this with some computer modeling. So here you have an example. Uh, of patients with various degrees of a distal femoral cut based on what type of joint line obliquity the patient has. And then you have a patient uh, in which you do a posterior femoral cut with three degrees of external rotation. So that's shown in pink and in blue are the various degrees of joint line obliquity. And you can see that there is an asymmetry between the posterior femoral cut and the distal femoral joint line if you're going to mechanically align the knee. So as what Charles found is that as that distal femoral joint line obliquity in valgus tends to increase, there is more pressure on the lateral aspect of the patellofemoral joint. And that seems to be more overstuffed and that may be causing them that anterior knee pain, which they hate. So how do you correct for that? Well, what he said is that whatever your posterior femoral cut is, 
um, you match it with the distal femoral joint line obliquity. So now your distal femoral joint line obliquity is shown in blue with four different variants. Whatever you make your distal femoral cut, you assess that and eventually you end up matching that with your posterior femoral cut. So yes, your posterior femur is cut in internal rotation uh, compared to the mechanically aligned knee, but at least you're matching your resection depths purely on a bony principle and you see what the patellofemoral kinematics are. Now, what about, um, uh, you know, this is another paper that came out of Australia. So what does the Australian literature say about this? Well, they looked at these forest plots and overall this diamond, this black diamond that you see, uh, which favors either kinematic or mechanical, what they've said is that the kinematic alignment favors better range of motion. So people seem to have better range of motion, but that does not translate into an actual functional benefit. So there is no difference in the distance that patients have walked. So what good is that better range of motion then, one should ask. Now let's look at different implant options and how they restore better kinematics or do they restore better kinematics. So these are the four different implant options we had discussed. So let's look at that. Let's look at rotating platform implants. So, you know, what happens in native knee kinematics, as we learned, is that there is some internal rotation with deep flexion because there is more translational effect on the lateral femoral condyle compared to the medial femoral condyle. So there happens to be about a 10 to 15 degrees of net internal tibial rotation. Okay, now in fluoroscopy, Dr. Ranawat's group has studied this. When they used a rotating platform implant, there is seven degrees of rotation in the tibia with the RP implant. There seems to be less rotation with the fixed bearing implant, but this, this benefit is still far away from the 10 to 15 degrees that normally happens. So maybe it is not as kinematically rotated as we think. However, as we discussed, rotating platform implants do seem to uncouple the rotational and translational forces. So perhaps there is um, benefit of reducing micro motion at the cement bone interface and what better way to see this than in revision principles. So this was uh, Dr. Ritter's group and they studied this and what they found with this uh, graph I'll highlight is that the RP design tended to go towards 40% less micro motion at the cement interface. So potentially there is a risk, there is a, a benefit to reduce loosening, especially in revision situations, which may be a good benefit to have. Now, what if you compare cruciate retaining rotating platform and posterior stabilized rotating platform designs? Well, they seem to be equivalent in terms of how much rotation they give you, especially when it comes to stair climbing. So that seems to be a good advantage to have. You can do either or. Let's look at the medial pivot design and its kinematics. So again, the medial pivot design, as we noticed, is this medial articulating ball and socket and lateral translation. So this is a, a study performed by Dr. Menigini from Indiana in which he used this smart tibial tray. So this is when you're doing your trialing, this tray comes with pressure sensors to see uh, what is the pressure in the medial compartment, as you can see on the left-hand side of this figure with this bar saying 71 and a lateral compartment, which is zero. So this is technically a medial pivot knee uh, because the medial side is loaded more. Well, it turns out that both the cruciate retaining and cruciate substituting designs in total knees essentially end up behaving like a medial pivot. And he found that a medial pivot by itself may be too simplistic. And we can kind of correlate this with the native knee kinematics. There seems to be in, in you know, patients who have a native ACL, which is intact, there seems to be an early lateral and late medial pivoting. So between zero degrees and 90 degrees, there seems to be lateral pivoting. And in 90 degrees to terminal flexion, there seems to be medial pivoting. So that seems to be normal. However, the opposite, which means early medial pivoting, and late lateral pivoting seems to be the least favorable. That seems to be the opposite of the native pivoting that you want to try and achieve. So again, Dr. Menegini's group, you know, used a single type of implant. I believe they use a striker implant, triathlon, and they use CR and CS polyethylenes. No PS polyethylene was used despite the status of a PCL. 
So the difference between a cruciate retaining and a cruciate substituting polyethylene is that the cruciate substituting has a more deep di uh, dish design. So it's more congruent. And that's how you get your constraint built into that. So what he found was that it's very hard to achieve the early lateral, late medial pivoting. So LLM type of pivoting. And this is an anesthetized patient. So God knows what happens when they get up and walk. And these are the differences he found. So only 16 patients got the LLM kinematics. All 47 to 50 patients got the other kinematic patterns. So it becomes unpredictable. Now, this is a Professor Haddad's group from uh, England, from London. And what they did was that they compared a single radius cruciate substituting implant versus a medial pivot. And they did a gait analysis. Is the medial pivot truly better than a single radius cruciate substituting design? And they found absolutely no difference in various gait parameters such as cadence, uh, step length, walking speed, the stance. And you can look at this data when you read this paper, but they found absolutely no difference between these designs. What about the asymmetric designs? So asymmetric designs, once again, have an asymmetric uh, tibia or tibial component uh, with an asymmetric polyethylene and sometimes an asymmetric distal femoral cut to keep the joint line in slight varus. So in this, um, this was a group from Italy that looked at the symmetric versus asymmetric design in mobile bearing total knees. And they performed a three-dimensional finite analysis. And they looked at various things like stresses, compressive and shear, and also um, the yield and the fracture rate of these implants. And in this, they found that asymmetric designs seem to eventually create lower stresses in gait and squat. And that makes sense because our knee by itself is asymmetric. But what they had done, which was important, is that this is a kinematically designed implant placed via mechanical alignment principles. So it is following the principles of naturally loading the knee relative to the mechanical axis of the knee, but building some kinematics into the actual implant. What about bicruciate retaining? So this is when you retain the ACL and the PCL in those implants. So this is a very interesting study which was performed in South Korea, in which what they did was that they compared your native knee to a cruciate retaining total knee. Then they compared that to a standard off the shelf by cruciate retaining total knee. And then they took it one step further. They went and compared it to a patient specific by cruciate retaining total knee. So these are patient specific guides on the patients specific to the patient's anatomy. So these are just the four examples of what they did. And they loaded the knee in gait and in deep knee bend. And what they found was that in gait, naturally there is a posterior tibial translation and internal rotation of the tibia. And this seems to be similar for the native knee and the patient specific by cruciate knee, not an off the shelf by cruciate knee. What about deep knee bend? In deep knee bending, as I mentioned, there is femoral rollback and you want more rollback laterally than medially. And there is rotation of the femur. Again, it seems to be similar for the native knee and the patient specific by cruciate retaining knee, not an off the shelf by cruciate retaining knee. So now it matters how you perform this by cruciate retaining. You cannot just say, I'll take something off the shelf and give them their natural anatomy. No, if you want to be a purist about it, you have to try and use a patient specific implant, which is more expensive and more challenging sometimes to, to place. A Japanese study also looked at this and they performed an in vivo fluoroscopic study. So they implanted patients and they used fluoroscopy. And again, in Asian populations, so India, Japan, China, uh, a lot of patients like the high flexion activities uh, like squatting and cross leg sitting. Uh, so they wanted to look at this in the Asian population. And what did they find? Uh, this is interesting. In this population, they found that you were able to get that dual pivot mechanism that Dr. Manigini's group had said is the most favorable. So it's the early lateral, late medial pivot in a bicruciate retaining design in high flexion. So this seems to be absolutely critical in achieving that high flexion, uh, which patients in Asian populations enjoy. Now, taking it further, this Japanese group said, what if we add a little bit of medial constraint to that polyethylene? So we take a bicruciate retaining design 
and we make a hybrid between a bi cruise sheet retaining and a medial pivot design. Well, in that, what they found is that enhancing or adding that extra bit of medial constraint seems to enhance the LLM, so early lateral late medial kinematics. And that seems to be a very favorable flexion principle. What about laxity? Now, how do you assess laxity in a bi cruciate retaining design? So this was a cadaveric uh, study performed by Dr. Bellman's group in Belgium. And they looked at varus valgus -like laxity during flexion and compre a compression distraction laxity with flexion using this bi cruciate retaining design. And they found, again, the native knee is in blue. The bi cruciate re retaining knee has this diamond gray effect. And that seems to match most closely with the native as compared to other designs. Although these differences, one can argue, are very, very close. So maybe not applicable in a real patient, but in a cadaver, there are slight differences which say that it is more like a native knee. Now, the question is, what if you have a patient um, that has on one side a native non-arthritic knee, on the other side, a, a bicruciate retaining total knee. Are they going to feel that my bicruciate retaining total knee is the same as my native knee? And that's why a surgeon would go through the effort of performing such a surgery. So this was a group that studied this and they looked at various degrees of rotation and various degrees of translation. I said that there are three rotational and three translational axes and that's what they looked at. The bicruciate retaining is in red the native non-operated knee is in green and these black bars at the bottom are the degree of error or the degree of a difference. So if the black bar is bigger, that means that there is a difference. If the black bar is smaller, there is very little difference. And as you can see from this figure, very simply stated, only when it comes to superior femoral translation is the bicruciate retaining total knee the same as a non-operated knee. Otherwise, it really doesn't behave the same as a non-operated knee. So it may not be that a patient after going through all this has a similar feeling knee even after you give them a bicruciate retaining design. So it's a little bit humbling in terms of this data. And what this group also found is that this early lateral late medial pattern was only found in about 50% of patients. So the other 50% of patients, the, the dual pivot pattern of rotation was uh, completely different and you cannot predict what you would get. Now, um, this is a, a group, this is a, a study out of Rush in Chicago. And what they did was that they looked at the kinematics, the kinetics and the muscle firing, um, especially with level and downhill walking with a cruciate retaining and now a bi-cruciate retaining design. So what are the muscle, what's the muscle doing with this? And what they found was that when you have level walking, there is a similarity between the bi-cruciate retaining and the cruciate retaining design. But with downhill walking, there was less muscle activation for the bi-cruciate retaining design. So that seems to be that proprioceptive advantage that the ACL gives saying, hey, you don't need to fire as many more uh, as many muscles because I am intact, I can protect the knee and you do not have to use muscle power now to stabilize the knee, the ligaments are doing their job. So that may be an interesting concept. But the holy grail is this, do natural kinematics equal to good function or restoring kinematics equal to good function as surgeons, as patients, that's what we are most interested in. So let's look at that. This is uh, Dr. Howell, who's performed probably the most kinematically aligned knees. And this is kind of his concept here in the United States. He looked at his data and function at 38 months. So he performed a study looking at the Oxford knee score on the WOMAC knee score uh, for his kinematically aligned knees, which were in the normal range a varus outlier or a valgus outlier and found absolutely no difference in the function. So this is a little confusing to me because you are trying to achieve kinematics, but let's say you have outliers, you either overshoot or you undershoot, there seems to be no difference. So then why do one versus the other? What about at 10 years? It seems that at 10 years, again, the function is no different and equally good whether you perform them in the range varus outliers or valgus outliers. So it almost seems like you can put the knee anywhere 
And as long as you put a good knee in, it should do well. Kinematic alignment. Now this is a group from, from uh, South Korea, which also looked like the, uh, at this, and they found really no difference uh, between the kinematically aligned knee and the mechanically aligned knee with the various different functional scores. Uh, and then this group from Australia performed forest plots and they found that whether it looks like knee society scores or combined knee society scores or range of motion, uh, the most studies seem to favor a kinematically aligned knee as compared to a mechanically aligned knee. So there may be some functional benefit there. But uh, if you look at distance walked, if you look at the, some of the other scores like the Knee Society, Oxford Knee Scores, WOMAC Scores, which focus more on the function, uh, there seems to be very little difference because this diamond, this black diamond seems to cross that threshold of zero, which is the, the boundary between a kinematic and a mechanically aligned knee. This was a very interesting paper that came out of New Zealand, uh, which got the Ranawat Award at the Knee Society meeting in 2007. And they found absolutely no difference in functional outcomes between a kinematically aligned knee and a functional aligned knee at two years when you randomize these patients. So they found absolutely no difference. And what is humbling to note is that this forgotten joint score is no different. So whether you give patients a kinematically aligned knee or a mechanically aligned knee, if you do a good job, patients still remember that they have a total knee and they do not forget it. A large proportion of them cannot forget that they have a total knee, maybe because they look at their incision and they've been through ex extensive physical therapy. Now, what about the Exeter group from England? Uh, what do they show? So when you have a planned kinematic or a planned mechanically aligned knee, there seems to be no difference whatsoever in function at two years follow-up. Uh, and they've looked at various different functional scores. Again, if you look at a kinematically aligned knee and an incorrectly kinematically aligned knee, so a varus or a valgus outlier, again, there seems to be absolutely no difference in the function. So then the, then the uh, data gets pretty murky that, well, then why should you pick one versus the other? It's almost like you think about approaches to a total hip. Why should you pick the anterior versus the posterior when the data is so murky and you can do whatever. If you do it well, you will end up with a good function. Now, um, this is function assessing the rotating platform design. So we are shifting from alignment to a uh, design feature. And is there any functional benefit? So several studies have looked at this. Rotating platform designs have been out there for a long time. This first one on the left is almost a 20 year follow up with a cementless tibia. And on the right, uh, you have a cemented tibia from a French study. And again, there seems to be really no difference whether you do a cementless design or a cemented design, the function seems to be good. Um, these new designs, do patients forget that they have a, a, a total knee? Are they able to say that this is more kinematic? Well, turns out that still 40 to 50% of them, uh, when it comes to RP designs, rotating platform design still have some grinding, some popping, some clicking. So it still feels like a mechanical device. It doesn't feel completely natural. And a large proportion of them still have trouble getting out from deep flexion activities like getting out from a chair. 36% uh, of these gender knees, 19% of uh, cruciate retaining knees seem to still have this problem. Uh, what about medial pivot designs? Are they more functional? Well, it seems that the medial pivot design patients felt the joint to be more normal compared, compared to the non-medial pivot design. So that seems to be a good thing. Uh, another thing is that if you look at the uh, CR, CS uh, designs in medial pivot versus non-medial pivot and PS design, there seems to be no uh, advantage using CR or CS versus PS. So you could, you could kind of go on to using whatever cruciate substituting, cruciate retaining, but if you give them a medial pivot, they seem to be doing equally well. Um, a dual pivot pattern. So the early lateral, late medial pivot pattern shown here in blue seems to have better satisfaction rates than other kinematic patterns. But as Dr. Menegini's group showed, it is very hard to predict if you can get that LLM type of kinematic pattern from a dual pivot uh, or from a medial pivot knee. Um, what about this? What about the medial clinical, uh, or sorry, the midterm clinical and radiographic results uh, between the medial pivot and posterior stabilized um, patterns? Again, there seems to be a functional benefit for medial pivot, but that it's not complete. 
Um, so this was uh, this was a study uh, is a Canadian study uh, which showed that the um, you know when you look at the forgotten joint score when you look at the fact that are you aware when you have an artificial joint when doing all these uh, designs there seems to be a slight preference for the medial pivot uh, group um, compared to the posterior stabilized group but it's not completely obvious asymmetric designs so the asymmetric polyethylene or the asymmetric uh, tibia or the asymmetric tibia, uh, femoral resection uh, seem to be equally functional between the SD, which is the blue, the symmetric, and the green, which is the asymmetric. And there was only one study. So I think that we need more data to look at this uh, comment, uh, before commenting on it. Um, what about the bicruciate retaining design? Well, it seems like you know, giving them or keeping their ACL, which seems to provide that proprioceptive advantage, doesn't seem any different between a cruciate retaining and a bicruciate retaining design. There seems to be similar joint awareness or a similar forgotten knee score or a forgotten joint score. Um, however, what you want to be careful about is the posterior slope when you put a bicruciate retaining design because if you put too much posterior slope, you tend to load the ACL a lot more and then the ACL can fail and your bicruciate retaining total knee can fail. So be careful how you apply this total knee arthroplasty. Um, Professor Beckman's group from Germany showed that if you use a custom or a patient specific bicruciate retaining total knee, you seem to have pretty good outcomes, but they weren't really able to compare it to something, some other type of designs. Uh, so average uh, knee society scores or average COOS scores uh, seem to be good when you perform this type of surgery. The forgotten joint score also seems to be higher uh, when you use a custom bicruciate retaining design uh, versus a unicondylar knee versus a posterior stabilized knee. So uh, if you were to think about it, the bicruciate retaining design should be closer to a uni because even in a uni, you're preserving the ACL and the PCL. Uh, and that forgotten joint score should be similar compared to a total knee in which you take out the ACL. So, and that seems to happen. The bicruciate retaining design seems to be closer compared to the uni, uh, but it seems to be uh, worst. The forgotten joint score, the lower score seems to be worst for a posterior stabilized design. So that seems to be at least uh, consistent. Uh, this is a study performed uh, that we performed at NYU. Uh, in which we performed a systematic review looking at the bicruciate retaining total knee. And it seems like overall the kinematics seem more like the native knee. There is superior proprioception, but it's technically challenging. And functionally, there seems to be no advantage comparing them to cruciate retaining total knees. So preserving that ACL, spending all this time seems to offer no functional benefit. What about survival. So I, I spoke extensively about the kinematics, whether or not they are restored. And it seems like in some cases they are, some cases they're not. In terms of function, the overall theme is that there is very little functional benefit in restoring the kinematics of the knee. But what about implant survival and more importantly, the bone survival? So the way I think about this is this, that if you have an implant that is perpendicular to the mechanical axis, you are going to load it in the most favorable way possible. But if you have an implant that is off the mechanical axis by more than three degrees, then there may be unfavorable loading. And where does that, does that lead to? Does that lead to early implant failures or early bone failure? So kinematic alignment, alignment survival. At six years, Professor Howell's group found that 98% of their implant survived. And there was a very low rate of revision per 100 component years. So good survival at short term follow up. What about at you know, uh, other groups? So this was from uh, Rush and from University, uh, so from uh, UPenn, and they found that at 38 months, again, there was a 98% survival and most revisions were for patella mild tracking. And that makes sense based on what we saw in the kinematic data. What about 10 years? So now we are getting into the midterm survival range. Again, Professor Howell's group found excellent survival uh, when he compared them. So revision for any reason 
was 98%, whether it was five years or 10 years, and revision for loosening was almost 99% survival um, uh, rates in terms of uh, loosening or aseptic loosening uh, at five years or 10 years. So it seems to be that these implants seem to survive for a very long time without loosening. So maybe something is good in terms of how you apply that. But what about uh, if you perform a meta-analysis? Does kinematic alignment improve uh, functions uh, after the um, uh, comparing to, to mechanical alignment? And there seems to be various different groups showing really no difference in the survival benefit of one versus the other. So seems like there seems to be at least no worse survival or no worse failure. It seems to be pretty equivalent. Now, this was the Ranawat Award uh, winning paper or the award winning study, which again showed that there was really no difference in survival, whether you do a kinematically aligned knee or a mechanically aligned knee. So it seems like you can do either and, and, and patients still do well. In terms of rotating platform implants, again, at follow up between 10 years and 20 years, the survival is excellent, 97, 98% survival, and it's equivalent to a kinematically aligned knee. In terms of a medial pivot design at midterm follow up, again, the survival is excellent. So, excellent uh, design. There are no survival studies to date of an asymmetric design, and we are beginning to use this design more and more, especially to restore the constitutional virus. But there seems to be uh, no survival study yet, so, data is still pending. In terms of the bicruciate retaining knee, there seems to be excellent 98% survival at three years, so very short-term follow-up. Uh, but when you see mid-term groups and long-term groups, there seems to be a higher reoperation rate with bicruciate retaining knees, predominantly due to stiffness and altered patellofemoral kinematics. And some other studies are humbling. It's not as high as some of the other designs or other alignment options where you only seem to have 80 or 90% survival at three years and there seem to be a higher rate of revision predominantly due to patellar problems or tibial loosening. So the conclusions are this from all the data that we've looked at, that native knee kinematics are very, very complex. Aiming to restore kinematics is even more challenging, whether you use kinematic alignment principles or kinematically aligned implants or kinematically designed implants. Restoring kinematics in an arthritic knee do not always correlate with outcomes. So there is still a disconnect between various different alignment types, various different implant types. We don't have a panacea. There is no single surgeon or single technique in the world. Otherwise, all of us and all patients would migrate to that center to say, we are going to get our knees done by this particular individual or with this particular implant. I think that the data is still kind of murky. The debate of this generation is whether or not we should use kinematically aligned knees or mechanically aligned knees and which type of implant design should we use. The debate of previous generations was using a mechanically aligned principle. Should we do a CR knee? or a PS knee? Should we resurface the patella? Should we not resurface the patella? So I think that the debate has changed, but the answers are still equally murky and equally um, uh, not clear to us on what we should do. So this is my personal bias. And, and you know I see a lot of patients with extreme deformities such as this. This is a windswept deformity. I tend to use either a large console navigation, so this is the brain lab system that I've shown there, or a small console navigation such as the ortho line, and I am aiming for a neutral mechanical axis as best as possible. Um, and this is the follow-up x-ray at two years. It looks like a pretty large polyethylene, but it's because of the soft tissue releasing that I had to perform to give a neutral mechanical axis to this patient and use a stem tibial component to try and reduce the loosening forces that I have created by bringing this patient back to her neutral alignment. Uh, I don't think that I could have kept this patient in kinematically aligned knees and given her a satisfactory outcome. Uh, this is the lateral views at two years. Again, the large polyethylene is because of significant soft tissue releasing. 
Uh, there are ways around it. You can build up the tibial tray and give them a smaller polyethylene, which seems to be the new way of doing things. And I wanted to show you videos comparing her function. So this is her before surgery, holding on to the edge of the bed, walking, uh, couldn't get up, couldn't cook, couldn't do anything for her family. You can see the extreme deformity. And now this is her walking down the hallway at two years follow up, uh, unassisted. Yes, uh, if we, we get into a debate whether or not her gait appears to be stiff, I would agree. Yes, it appears to be stiff, uh, but she seems to be able to do the function that uh, she is designed to do and that she wants to do uh, without compromising on her outcomes, at least in the short term. Now, the long term data in such knees, uh, we can wait and watch, but she seems to be happy and se she seems to be functional. So I still preserve the mechanical, I still follow the mechanically aligned principle. I like to restore that. And if I am aiming for zero, sometimes I'll be in three degrees of varus, sometimes I'll be in three degrees of valgus. And maybe that is kinematic for the patient. But if I'm aiming for five to seven degrees of varus or valgus, I may go into an opposite spectrum. And then that may be trouble for the patient, both functionally and in terms of the implant. With that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So we have another excellent presentation from your side. I mean, you come from a center which develops and uh, uses all the cutting edge technology. And a uh, couple of questions. Uh, so like what you said, uh, the debate till now has been on, I mean, every conference, I mean, there are conferences in India that have been uh, there for 15 years. Like every year you have a say, like one, two, three, and at these conferences, the first talk is usually CR versus PS, <laughs> resurfers versus non-resurfers, navigation versus non-navigation, and now we have kinematic versus mechanical as well. And this is going to be the next, for maybe for five to 10 years, this is going to run for those first two slots. And I'm really surprised you saw those extreme deformities in uh, there because I thought, people would seek medical attention much earlier. I thought those deformities are only in this part of the world. Yeah, so you know, this is, uh, as you, as uh, everybody world over is uh, aware of the challenges that we faced with coronavirus in the US and then the racial inequality challenges that we are facing. Uh, so a large proportion of these patients unfortunately don't have access to good healthcare resources, even in places like Washington, DC. So I was surprised as well when I started practice in DC, but there are these patients that exist uh, all across in the US. There are patients that are immigrants from various different countries who just haven't had access to healthcare. Uh, so we see these massive deformities uh, also, you know, it's rare compared to India, but we do see them. And just a note on with, uh, when I worked with Dr. Maniara before, and uh, I remember him telling me that, uh, see, I don't like to keep my patients in neutral alignment. I just keep them in one to two degrees of varus. So he, he always tells me, I don't, because sometimes patients find it difficult that their thighs rub against each other and they find it walking a bit difficult. Then it didn't make sense to me, but now I think what he said was right. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I agree with you from, from that principle. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the intent of this talk was to clarify or aim to clarify what should a new arthroplasty surgeon or a practicing arthroplasty surgeon do? I mean, should we um, put everybody in a little bit of RS? Should we put those valgus players in that? Or should we fix it with, uh, you know, different types of implant options? So my bias now, I think as I'm, as I'm getting more refined into this, is maybe I will use an asymmetric implant um, and put them in that little bit of virus as opposed to aiming for that in my bone cuts. That's just a personal bias. Okay, so we have uh, Dr. Senthil also with us. Senthil is a staff orthopedic surgeon. He works in a busy arthroplasty unit in Dallas, Texas. Senthil, uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, well, you can pose your questions to Dr. Savia because you've been moderating our previous sessions as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, it's a wonderful talk, you know, like it's a lot of information. You It was very comprehensive. You covered the kinematics function and uh, the outcome. So, um, well, uh, what about uh, kinematic alignment in uh, obese patients? What's your take on it? 
Yeah, fantastic question. So, you know, again, we don't have, we have a lot of data in obese patients, right? Uh, but we also, at least we are starting to see a lot of uh, aseptic loosening in addition to the infectious complications, especially in the tibia. So I think that the obese patient tibial component is stressed a lot more than a non-obese patient. And what we have started doing anecdotally, again, no data to support this, but anecdotally is if I see a patient between a BMI of 35 and 40, I am starting to put in uh, a tibial stem in those patients. Now I am a press fit person. So I like press fit stems that engage the isthmus. And in those patients, if you try and uh, do kinematics, the stem may end up going out the lateral tibial cortex. So I think that that is a problem. So I think that in that obese patient in my hand, if I was a follower of kinematics, I would then switch them to a more mechanically aligned uh, principle or restore kinematics with a kinematically uh, designed implant. That's good. That's good. So choosing between a standard bone conserving cruciate or a posterior stabilized versus uh, with a kinematic alignment versus a, a hinge implant with extensive release. Uh, uh, for a kind of like a severe deformity, your preference will be a mechanical alignment with the hinged implant. Yes, so I think that you know I uh, part of my fellowship was with the Insol group, so I think that uh, that Insol uh, you know philosophy has stuck with me of starting with the least amount of uh, constraint and then building up as you need it. So you know if I perform, um, I don't perform CR knees. Um, I, I would give them a little bit more constraint by the CS uh, implant. But if you have a significant uh, deformity or significant, uh, uh, you know, soft tissue restrictions, uh, then I prefer going to that hinge with extensive releases and a hinge. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, Senthil, that you mentioned this. Um, you know, part of my training, I did a European Meat Society Fellowship and in Switzerland, uh, a lot of surgeons, when they see a valgus deformity between five and 10 degrees of valgus, they are very quick to put in a hinge implant in those patients. And they do not perform kinematic principles in those patients. They go very quickly to a hinge. Uh, and they are, maybe it's because their data shows that they, if they uh, don't do that, patients seem to fail earlier. Now, that may be based on what Swiss patients are doing. So a lot of these people, are you know hiking in the Alps, skiing, so on and so forth. Um, whereas patients in DC or maybe even patients in Texas, all they want to do is get out of a car and go to the McDonald's and come back. So I think that the functional aspect of patients is very important to recognize. I totally agree with you, you know, because um, if you kind of go for a kinematic alignment in obese patients, uh, young 65 year, less than 65 year old, young active patients, um, then, you know, they're more likely to be not satisfied with their uh, outcome, you know, like that. Um, I'm a CR guy. I kind of uh, used to push CR for uh, everything, you know, like a stiff knee. I just recently published a, a cohort of 30 patients with com severe stiff knee um, mm -hmm. using CR. And uh, I went back to India for uh, like three years and I practiced in India where I saw a lot of the severe deformities, the ones you showed like the, those kind are very common in India. So mm -hmm. I, I was able to get away with the kinematic alignment in those patients, not like, like a restricted kinematic alignment. Like I may still correct it and bring them to a relative valgus because they were used to being in varus for so long. Even if mm -hmm. I kind of bring them from a 10 degree varus to a two degree varus or a, even a four degree varus, the knee uh, loading pattern has changed to a relative valgus and they do really well functionally. And mm -hmm. I can still get away with a CR knee or sometimes very rarely I go for a PS knee. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I don't know the answer. Like you rightly said, we don't have a good answer around that. You know, like we still don't know. I think kinematic uh, is definitely a very good option, but we still don't know where it's going to work and where it's not going to work. That's the answer we're still looking for. Absolutely. So, you know, scrubbed with uh, Charles Rivier. Uh, and Charles is, uh, <laughs> he has this fantastic uh, catchphrase, you know, for, uh, for patients. He offers a la carte joint replacement. So a la carte meaning he will design the surgery and uh, also the implant based on patient specific variations. Uh, so you order off of a menu, you know, that's what the implication is. 
But when I scrub with Charles, the first step that he does in a medial parapetal approach, as most of us do, is we perform the medial release, the medial peel. And in doing the medial peel, you eventually are releasing some of the deep fibers of the MCL. So right then and there, I asked Charles, I'm like, Charles, if we are saying a pure kinematically aligned knee relies only on bony resection and not on soft tissue releasing, are we being absolutely pure in performing this uh, medial peel? And the answer is no. So I think that what Senthil, you are doing and what I think we are shifting our gears to is I don't think it's one versus the other. It's not that simple. Maybe a restricted model, uh, maybe a better way to look at this, you know, a more conservative model. Yeah. So even in young patients with severe deformity, you are okay with using hinge knee? Because I know like there is a recent uh, Mayo data saying like 90% survival with hinge knee at 10 years. So are you a little liberal with primary knees and young guys with severe deformity and using hinge processes? Uh, I am, but you know, I, I think I think Senthil, we need to we need to kind of uh, focus on another principle in in young patient with severe deformities, and uh, this is not is not as apparent in in places like India because you know cost is a big factor. Whereas here in the U.S., as you know, cost is a factor, but insurance covers so much. Uh, is that maybe we can get away with metaphyseal augmentation options? Uh, in severe deformity. So I have, um, I'm establishing a series of patients where um, a lot of deformity, uh, a lot of defects. Uh, what if you, in those patients, put in a, a tibial stem um, and you put in a metaphyseal augment, like a cone, uh, a sleeve, um, or cement, um, and try and correct the deformity with the soft tissue releases uh, and give them the minimal level of constraint. Does that do better than a hinge? Uh, I think that the numbers are so low, uh, but I hope that that is one thing that we can now put in our armamentarium. Mm -hmm. Orthoaline, how often you use it? I, I used it but uh, initially, but I now use it a kind of uh, only in patients with uh, like intramedullary denial where I'm trying to avoid, and then uh, you know, where I extra articular deformity and things like that. So you are liberal with orthoaline? because uh, you, you're a consultant or uh, you know how, uh, how does it work? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, each time I use it, I get paid for it. No, I wish it was that way. Um, no, so, you know, I, I, um, from, a, from a design perspective, what I like about OrthoLine is that, you know, my tibial cut is very predictable. You know, uh, mm -hmm. so I have, you know, just like you, you mentioned, uh, there is this focus, navigated, non-navigated. Is, is there a benefit in preventing um, uh, fat embolus a pulmonary embolus by not instrumenting the femoral canal. So this is my philosophy. Again, you know, very, there's no real data to show it. I do not like the femoral uh, motion with ortho line. It is a very cumbersome, you know, the lateral movement and up and down. It is a little bit uh, not intuitive to me. So in cases where I have a small console navigation in that hospital, if they don't have a big console, I will use ortho line for my tibial cuts both in total knees and in unis, because I can really predict well, and it's very simple. It doesn't take me very long to do it. For the femur, I will do it just like you said, if there is some hardware that precludes me from going intramedullary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, my thing is, uh, I find that uh, the steps, number of steps involved in using uh, the TBL side to be more than like uh, with the strap and things like that. Yes. So, yeah. You know, a little more cumbersome. So I've been using uh, ortho aligned anytime when there is a deformity on the uh, femoral side. And for the tibial side, I was using the, the uh, conventional exactly. navigation, you know. So um, what about uh, your experience with ortho sensor, very sense, ortho sensor? Yeah, you so, you know, um, I personally don't use it. But, uh, you know, a lot of the people in Belgium and uh, one of the people who trained me, Patrick uh, Meir at NYU, uh -huh. had extensive experience with this. And I okay. think that if uh, you had to invest in one type of technology, if your hospital had to invest in that, I would say that that is a fantastic uh, device because it gives you such real-time data. Now, the question is, how reliable is that data um, when it comes to different implant systems? You know, because pressures in a Smith & Nephew may be different than in a striker or in a, in a Depew. Uh, and uh, how can you correlate that with preoperative pressure? 
that's i think the 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 key if you can say that wait this is the pre operative pressure this is the intraoperative pressure and now we have a post operative pressure uh, somehow we can measure that i think that that will be our our answer in some ways yeah i agree you know um and also it will be interesting uh, to see what's the role of ortho sensors in kinematic knees you know like uh, so yeah i've used it uh, in a bunch of cases um i it's like you don't need it 